Welcome to Tony at 12. I'm Tony LeBlanc and today I'm in conversation with Ian Hogarth from the RNLI. Ian is also a trustee of the Association of Lighthouse Keepers and lighthouses are our topic today. Ian, good to see you. Great to see you, Tony. It's uh, wonderful to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, it's our pleasure. First of all, a brief history. Because, um, you know, we've, we've done a bit of joint research on this and, and we've discovered it goes back to 660 BC. Yeah, absolutely. I, lighthouses um, and beacons of various kinds for navigation have been around pretty much for as long as humankind's been going out to sea. Um, first instances uh, of it being recorded were probably in about 660 BC when a Greek poet by the name of Lachesis mentions a lighthouse um, near the uh, ancient Greek city of uh, Siglion, which was uh, north of Anatolia. Uh, that's probably the first ever uh, record, the first ever mention of uh, a, a lighthouse or a beacon used for navigation. And, and, and sort of taking it on a little bit further, we have one of the seven wonders of the world, the great pharaoh of Alexandria in Egypt. Yes, absolutely. And that was a structure that the belief to have been constructed around about 280 BC, a colossal structure around about 100 meters tall, made of solid blocks of granite and limestone, um, severely damaged by earthquakes, really from about the 1700s all the way up to the 1300s. And by the time of the 1300s, the last earthquake in 13, uh, 1303 pretty well destroyed it completely. It must have been colossal um, with a big uh, sort of uh, fire on top of it for the purpose of navigating and illumination. Yeah, very interesting that. And and the other thing I was quite interested in, because I've been to uh, La Cronia in Spain and um, one of their, their lighthouse there together with Dover, um, people have sort of done a bit of an analysis architecturally on it and discovered um, that... Uh, there are Roman remains holding the places up. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. that We know of three um, lighthouses that have got Roman remains in uh, Dover and Nacruna, as you say, but also one at a place called Leptis Magna in Libya. Um, these were, again, um, rudimentary beacons, um, often octagonal stone-shaped towers um, that uh, would have... Um, had braziers on the top of them, needed constantly refueling throughout the time they were lit to, to enable uh, traders and mariners to be able to locate where the ports might be. Um, the one at the Kruna was extensively rebuilt uh, in the uh, nineteen in the eighteen hundreds to the yeah. uh, to the version it is now. But uh, what would have been a beautiful lighthouse? Yeah, very interesting that. So, you know, we don't have much British history. Well, we have some, of course, but it seems from what I've been reading that the need for lighthouse was houses were because of all the wrecked collier ships in the North Sea. And uh, that started it off. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's that's correct, Tony. Um, the, the, the development and the building of lighthouses has often followed trade. If you go back in history, um, it was actually the Board of Trade in, in various countries that would sanction lighthouses because of the need to protect the maritime uh, uh, traffic. And um, the, the traffic that you talk about from Newcastle, bringing coals down to London, really important for industry at the time. And um, at the time, there was huge shipping losses uh, because ships just really navigating that tricky passage up into the Thames. So there was a program, uh, and really the first lighthouse re within Britain would have been at Lowestoft in about 1609. Mm -hmm. And this was a couple of uh, tall wooden towers with with with, with a, a furnace, a burner, a brazier sort of style thing on top that would have helped mariners um, locate their position and understand whereabouts they were. Um, and then, of course, we, we, we come to the more permanent jobs. And, and, of course, the first one that springs to mind is the Edison in Plymouth, 1696. That was around for a little while, wasn't it, before it got wrecked? It was. So in 1698, uh, Henry Wynne Stanley, uh, he had been given the commission for the first lighthouse on the Edison Rock, a really important 
um, well, a rock about 12 miles uh, off the coast of, of out of Plymouth Harbour. Plymouth Harbour at that time, really important for trade and for uh, naval activities. Henry Wynne Stanley, he was given the commission to build the first lighthouse, and he did so in 1698, a really elegant, but not quite practical lighthouse. Um, that one lasted until the great storm of 1703, when it was destroyed with uh, Henry Wynne Stanley and five others in, in it. Because the Eddystone Rock um, was such a risk uh, to maritime traffic, there was then petitions for uh, and then actions in place for uh, a replacement tower to go on. And the engineer, John Rudyard, he constructed this mainly wooden conical tower um, that was first lit five years later in 1708. That lasted till about 1755, after which it caught fire and burned to the ground. And then we see a replacement tower designed by an engineer called John Smeaton, a granite tower, so a tower made out of granite blocks, and it starts to become the style of lighthouse engineering and development that we take for granted now. This beautiful sort of oak tree shaped uh, structure, um, broad at the bottom, rising up into the middle and then flaring out at the top, made of granite blocks. And he, he, he used this thing called hydraulic line as well. He developed it, which was a special cement that ensured that those blocks would set underwater, uh, creating a really permanent structure that could withstand the storms uh, and the light, yeah. yeah and the blocks yeah. were the, the blocks were dovetailed as well i believe so you know once so, again yeah. that locked it in as it were yeah, yeah absolutely tony they were they were dovetailed which means that almost like a jigsaw puzzle dovetailed to the side up and down and it created this really rigid structure it, it, it was first lit in 1759 with and the illumination source was 24 candles in 1877, so it lasted over 100 years, they decided to replace it. And the only reason they decided to replace it was because the rock on which it was placed was actually starting to be undermined. Right. Because the lighthouse was so important and, and held in such high regard um, by the people of Plymouth, the lighthouse was actually brought ashore and is actually on, on, on Plymouth Hoe now. You can go and visit it. But then in 1882, we see the wonderful current tower built uh, by William Douglas, and it's still standing and it's still operational today. Still totally functional. Now, yes. a, a, another engineer comes on, onto the scene with, uh, in the form of Robert Stevenson and the Bell Rock up in Scotland, another dodgy area in terms of navigation, presumably. Absolutely. And it was the first of the major lights up along the east coast of Scotland. Uh, quite significant traffic around there, especially out of our growth. And it was first lit in 1811. Um, and it was lit using um, a wonderful uh, straight stone tower. And it was lit using a system of parabolic reflectors and lamps, which were essentially uh, lamps with reflectors behind. But what Stevenson did is he, he created this system um, that would revolve using a clockwork mechanism to create a light pattern of alternate red and white lights. That lasted until 1842, after which it was upgraded. And because they don't really waste anything, the lighthouse authorities ship that off to Newfoundland for further use. Yeah. The, and the replacement lasted until 1902. But it's interesting that at the time they were burning spermaceti oil. Um, and it wasn't until 1877 that the Bell Rock was actually converted to a paraffin light. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the Argand lamp, which came in around 1782? Because that was quite a departure from what they'd been up to up until that point. It, it was. The, the issue with what they were using prior to the development of the Argand lamp was they were either candles uh, made of normally um, poor materials or they were using lamps. And of course, what happened is very quickly the lamps would sort up if they were in glass or if there were reflectors behind them. And so the power of the light would diminish and render the lighthouse less effective. So a Swiss inventor um, developed uh, the Argand lamp in 1782. And what was special about the Argand lamp is that it was a tubular wick. And what that did is it enabled the, the lamp design, enabled more oxygen to reach the flame, and therefore it would burn brighter 
brighter for longer. And actually, it would, it would produce five times more light. So it really was beneficial in terms of, um, in terms of lighthouse development. The Argan lamp, though, it never really got, um, it, it never really saw long service with lighthouses because it was then superseded by something called the Fresnel lens, which revolutionized lighthouse optics. Yeah, yeah. And and then, of course, we get into this subject of clockwork rotation. So, you know, you've actually got a flashing light suddenly appearing, yeah? Absolutely. That's right. So clockwork rotation came about because the development uh, of the the lighthouse authorities were perpetually trying to improve the quality and the strength of light at lighthouses to enable it to be more beneficial. Uh, August, Augustin Fresnel, a French engineer, had developed this system of uh, lenses, which were perfect for lighthouse operation. What they did is essentially condensed the light um, from the light source and, and concentrated it into a beam. But what they needed to do is that lens needed to be rotated and it needed to be rotated so that each lighthouse could almost get its own signal or what we call its own character. And so it needed to be rotated constantly. What was developed was this, this clockwork mechanism whereby the, the lighthouse keepers would have to wind up a series of weights on a chain that would then descend through a long weight tube going right down through the lighthouse tower. It was governed by a governor, again, all clockwork operated, no electrics at this time, and it would ensure a constant rotation of the lens. And by enabling that rotation, that lens to be rotated, could mean that the signal and, and the character of the light would become that much more reliable. And it was an amazingly simplistic but effective system. And it, it lasted it lasted for over 100 years before it started to be developed. And then, of course, we get the arrival of electricity, which I suppose totally changed everything. It did. And the development of electricity for lighthouses is not a new phenomenon at all. It actually, the first... Um, the first developments of electricity for lighthouses date back to 1857, when a carbon arc light was developed at Blackwall uh, Lighthouse for Trinity House uh, in London. Of course, Michael Faraday at the time was the scientific advisor to Trinity House. So all the latest developments and all, all his latest ideas, he was testing in the lighthouse service. In 1858, we then saw a carbon arc light installed at South Fordham Lighthouse. And then in 1871, the first lighthouse built specifically for electric illumination was opened up at Suta in the north in the northeast. Um, it was incredibly, it was a great success. It enabled a very bright light um, to uh, be created. Um, however, it was adopted intermittently. So that Suta lighthouse that I talk about, by 1914, it had actually changed from electricity generation. Uh, to paraffin, because there was a realization that in order to use electricity, you need a uh, quite a lot of fuel to generate yeah. that electric that electricity. And that that was the reason for that. Now, something that quite intrigued me. I mean, we always refer to lighthouses as being administered by Trinity House, but I didn't realize that they were granted their royal charter in fifteen fourteen. So they're more than five hundred years old to improve the art and science of mariners. And uh, they had arms houses and welfare and pensions for seamen. So how did they get into the world of lighthouses from there? Essentially, it started off with Trinity House and, and it celebrated, as you say, it's 500 years in 2014. It, it started off in terms of um, that Royal Charter. Actually, when you go right back in time, started because uh, mariners at Deptford uh, in, in London were really fed up with unregulated Thames pilots of mm. dubious quality. And so once uh, the Royal Charter was gained for that um, and to provision for the safety of mariners and to improve their welfare, lighthouses was almost um, the next stage. Um, they, of course, by 1609, they had the lowest off light. Prior to that, in 1594, Trinity House uh, gained responsibility for boys, and these are much smaller lights um, that um, normally uh, show shipping channels. 
So, of course, Lighthouses was then the next development from those boys. So it started really with piloting, then it went to boys, and, of course, Lighthouses was the next logical step for that. Yeah, so um, in interestingly, from that point of view, because um, up, up until now, am I right in thinking, in that some of these lights were owned privately? Uh, they, 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 you know, anyone could stick a light up almost. <laughs> they were owned privately. There was a system really whereby uh, Lighthouse Provision um, was a, a, a private enterprise um, with uh, petitions granted to enable them to do so. It was really intermittent in terms of the standard of Lighthouse, the actual provision of light. And of course, the reason why private entrepreneurs liked this is because they could collect light dues from yeah. passing ships. It, it took until 1836 for Trinity House to gain the necessary powers uh, to take over the private uh, lights. Uh, and that enabled them to start thinking about uh, a uniform provision of lighthouse, uh, a, a level of quality, and it avoided all the profiteering that, that was going on. If we take the Smalls Lighthouse, which is off the uh, Welsh coast, in the early 1800s, that was racking up a year around about six and a half thousand pounds worth of, of income for the owner, which in today's money would be over 430,000 pounds. Wow. <laughs> in, in 1823, Trinity House offered to buy it. Yeah. Um, the valuation of the owner said, well, we think it's worth about 148,000 pounds. This is in 1823 money. And it wasn't until 1826, Act of Parliament, that Trinity House were able to purchase it for the sum of £170,000, which in today's money would be over £15 million. That's and incredible. again, it is. And the same thing happened around the coast um, to buy out these leases. But what it did mean is it meant that over time, Trinity House then took over responsibility for all the major lights of England and Wales. What, what Were these uh, purchases of these private lighthouses funded by the government? Trinity House it operates as a corporation and all of Trinity House's um, activities uh, are generated by light dues from shipping. So any ship that passes any lighthouse uh, of a certain tonnage has to pay light due. Those dues are then collected centrally um, and then used in the running of the lighthouse service, which normally isn't allowed to make a profit. So the light dues are always kept capped at the cost to operate the service. Uh, the money for these lights would have come from central government to which Trinity House would have paid back uh, over time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and they Trinity House were involved in both the world wars in terms of uh, buoying safe channels in the White Sea and the Persian Gulf in World War I and uh, piloty service in World War II. So, you know, they, they, they're very much at the forefront of um, this sort of stuff. Uh, absolutely. And um, there was a there was a significant amount of um, activities that Trinity House coordinated in both world wars. It is important to note as well that certainly in the Second World War and, and for a large part in the First World War, the lighthouses went dark. So yeah. uh, after war was declared, the lighthouses would not illuminate as they do every night now. Um, they were only illuminated certainly in the Second World War for convoys uh, under the instruction of the Admiralty. But Trinity House's pilotage service uh, played a significant part in the Dunkirk evacuations. And then again, when D-Day came around, they provided buoys and light vessels to mark the sea lanes. And actually, all the commercial vessels uh, that took part in D-Day, the Trinity House pilots were responsible uh, for them all. Uh, so in both world wars, Trinity House played a really important part, not just in the provision of lighthouses and navigation lights where needed, but also in terms of movement of troops and all of the war effort as well. Now, they, they, they are involved with the RNLI, and perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, Trinity House and the Ireland and I actually don't have any, have never had any formal links. But of course, both organisations have a common aim, which is saving lives at sea and protecting mariners. So there's always been lots of informal links throughout the centuries. Uh, the Ireland and I celebrating 200 years, surely. Um, keepers would often call out lifeboats uh, around the coast because keepers were the eyes and the ears around their, their lighthouses. And uh, there was often a very close relationship between light keepers uh, and, and lifeboat uh, crews uh, throughout the country, throughout both countries. 
And uh, taking on the point you made about, you know, Lighthouse's local involvement, when Alderney had a manned lighthouse, uh, they, it controlled the 999 services for the island. So far, ambulance or police rang 999 and got through to a lovely man called Doddy, uh, who's one of the crew there. And, and, you know, he would be able to then get in touch with the relevant authority, put the fire out, send the ambulance out or whatever. So we've missed out a little bit on that, I guess, haven't we now? <laughs> Absolutely. So that happened on Alderney, as you mentioned, and also on Sark. Uh, and the, the lighthouse keepers would, would take the emergency call and contact the relevant services. They had a wonderful relationship with the with the local emergency services. A local fire brigade on Alderney would often practice near the lighthouse then come in for a cup of tea. Um, <laughs> and if you ask any former light keeper, they always regarded Alderney as a wonderful posting um, with local farms able to supply milk and eggs and all the other trappings of life. So that's it was good. a really great posting. That's good. Um, talking about the fact that you get charged every time you go up the English Channel, they get ba banged a bit here, don't they? You get the Caskets firstly, then the Alderney one, and then the Goury one. Absolutely. That's, that's what within about 20 miles, isn't it? Or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, there's a, there's a network of really important lighthouses around that stretch because, um, especially around the Channel Islands, there's often there, there are some significant tides and currents. Um, Cascades, this actually was a light there from around about the 1720s. And these were three really impressive towers with coal fires on top. Um, and um, in 1783, the lease reverted to Trinity House. And then in the 1870s, it was uh, the, the lighthouse and cuscus was re-engineered um, to the present form that we see now. And actually, keepers were there until the 1990s. So uh, it's not it's, that long ago. And it's an isolated reef, isn't it? It is, absolutely. It didn't yes. really have any proper landing facilities as such. No, no, they, these, the lighthouses didn't. And really... The, the challenge of getting lighthouse keepers to all of these isolated uh, locations, um, up until the 1960s, it was by boat relief, so by, by local boatsmen. Yeah. And that was always dependent on the weather and tides, and it was often that reliefs would run late. But then by the late 1960s, we see the development of helicopters for relief of lighthouse keepers, and that's when we start to see on some of the major lights around the coast, helipads go on above the tower yeah. that enabled reliefs to take place on time and in virtually any weather condition. So at what stage did full automation take place in the UK? You know, have you got a sort of last lighthouse, last mined lighthouse date? If you look at lighthouse automation, it's not a new thing. In fact, from the 1930s, uh, lighthouse authorities were starting to look at automating lights. And we saw the development of acetylene uh, and automatic sun valves, which were valves that would be triggered by sunlight, start to be used in lighthouses that enabled keepers to be withdrawn. 1960s, we saw um, the, the relieving of keepers using helicopters, but then from then onwards, we start to see a program of automation as as uh, lighthouse authorities work out how to re-engineer lighthouses to enable them to operate it automatically. So in 1982, the one that we've talked about, Eddystone, that was automated. And then 1991, we see even the first solar uh, powered lighthouse at Lundy North go live. But it was a gradual process. Uh, systems were trialed and implemented. And actually, it wasn't until 1998 that automation was completed with North Foreland Lighthouse. And the same sort of pattern happened at exactly the same time in Ireland and, and Scotland. And so we all lighthouses are now automated. Uh, a team of engineers uh, do go out from the lighthouse authorities to in inspect and to maintain them. And some lighthouses in Ireland and in Scotland, they have local attendants that just keep a watch on the lighthouses to make sure they're operating properly. Well, I miss the sound of the local foghorn, Ian. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and the rotating lights, because it's now LEDs. It is LEDs. And foghorn still exist in some uh England and Wales lighthouses, but they're very limited because um, lighthouse authorities, after extensive research, have realised that they're becoming less and less important to navigation. Yeah. Um, in, so in England and Wales, there's still a few lights. We are seeing a second generation of lighthouse automation, um, which is where those beautiful rotating lenses uh, are now being replaced by 
LED lights um, that enable uh, the similar sort of light to be produced using a fraction of the power. And it means that the lighthouse authorities can start to remove these big generators, big diesel tanks that they would have in lighthouses for maintaining the lights. So in a way, whilst it's sad to see the loss of the lenses and these those, those uh, lights at night, um, it's just the next step in uh, lighthouse engineering, I guess. Can you tell us a little bit about the Channel Light Vessel? Well, the Channel Light Vessel, actually, it was introduced in 1979 um, because there was the, the need for a uh, channel segregation scheme to go in. Um, and what it did is enabled the, the segregation scheme to be effective and to mark the start of it. Introduced in 1979, actually the keepers were withdrawn from there in 1989 uh, after 10 years. And being a keeper on a, a light vessel was a really challenging job, even in comparison to being a lighthouse keeper. Um, you needed to be have good sea legs and uh, uh, light vessels were always at risk of collisions. Um, so keepers were withdrawn in 1989 and actually the channel light vessel itself, it was the last light vessel and it, it was withdrawn in 2021 and replaced by a, a, a light buoy. And these light buoys are not just simply a, a blinking light as they might have been in the past. Nowadays, they are um, really amazing pieces of technology that will broadcast their location, broadcast signals, broadcast weather to ships. So um, still doing the same job as yeah. previously what a big light vessel would have done. Yeah, yeah. Now, you are a trustee of the Association of Lighthouse Keepers. So let's uh, talk a little bit about that. When was it formed? So it's a charitable trust, and we it was formed in 1988. And originally, the purpose of it uh, was a way for former lighthouse keepers to keep in touch as they were being made redundant uh, due to automation. But such was the public interest in light uh, in lighthouses and light keepers that membership was open to the public. And now we have over 900 members across the world. Um, you don't have to be a lighthouse keeper to join. And our, our aim is really to keep lighthouse heritage alive, promoting visits, online events, uh, podcasts, social media and development of an archive. The level of public interest and enjoyment of lighthouses is, is significant and growing. Um, and it's wonderful. But what's not to love about lighthouses, whether it's the architecture, uh, their location, the history, the flora, the fauna, there's so much enjoyment out of lighthouses. They're, they're just amazing uh, and incredible stru structures. So, so how do you work it? You, you know, you sort of are able to take people around to these various locations and uh, uh, presumably all, all the lighthouse members are in touch via email and the internet and everything else. That, that's right. I mean, we have a big presence on social media through the usual channels and through a quarterly journal. Uh, we arrange trips out to lighthouses that you can't normally get to. And we have a great relationship with the general lighthouse authorities, including Trinity House, the Northern Lighthouse Board and the Commissioners of Irish Lights, who are, are really supportive in, in our activities. Um, but what we do is we do encourage uh, lighthouses uh, to be open for the public as well. And we run an annual Lighthouse of the Year competition that celebrates lighthouses that can be visited by members of the public. It's really important part of our history. So if you want to be a member of the Association of Lighthouse Keepers, go to the website and presumably all the information is there. That's correct, Tony. Yep, alk.org.uk will get you to our wonderful website and uh, we would welcome anybody. Well, that's great. That's really good. Ian, it's been an absolute privilege to talk to you. Thank you so much for spend, spending me, sparing me some time. It's a very, very interesting subject and it must have saved thousands of lives over the years, much in the same way as the RNLI. Of course, Tony, you're absolutely correct. Um, both really important for mariners. Thanks, Ian. You take Thank care you, of yourself. Bye. Thanks. Bye.